Well, first of all, thank you, everybody that's turning up, because if you're on this podcast today uh, with us, you've already understood the brevity of what digital transformation means uh, to you as an organization. So what I'm actually going to do is take seven years of research, I think, probably maybe eight, actually, and try and compress it into the process of possibly 45 minutes to an hour. And also there'll be some polls, not because we're going to test if people are right or wrong, but just this polling type of idea lets you understand where you are maybe in that continuum of change. Uh, as was politely said by Daniel, this is the number one selling book uh, globally on digital transformation. Uh, one of these chapters has been downloaded, I think it's approaching 350,000 times. And that chapter's on optimal mindset. Uh, it was a combination of interviews with a fellow at MIT, uh, maybe the most famous sports psychologist in the world who worked with Felix Bongartner, and the head coach of an NFL Super Bowl winning team, uh, the Seattle Seahawks. But the reason I think why the chapter is particularly good is its premise quite simply is it doesn't matter what technologies you make, doesn't matter what technologies you buy, there's a mindset structure, a DNA to this process that will separate those that are successful from those that are really struggling in this process. So ask yourself a super simple question. Uh, really imagine what tomorrow could look like and what side of that future history you'll be on. And the reason why I ask this is a very simple statistic that we've been measuring for, gosh, really seven or eight years now. 97.5% of all CEOs, all executive C-suite in the global 2000s understand what digital transformation is about. They understand that they need to do it. What is really scary, and the number used to just be 18%, and it's now barely at 28%, but just really less than one third actually are benefiting economically from all these changes, have changed the way they think, the way they design, the way they act, to really make a difference in terms of thriving. We measured this across, gosh, 26 different metrics, models, OPEX, CAPEX, processes, everything else. But this small proportion that are successful suck up an unbelievable proportion of the outcome. So some recent work we did with uh, IBM Cognitive Systems, just around AI, says 15% of this Global 2000 group have got the management and measurement of AI right and suck up over 65% of all the possible upsides with AI. So if you're looking to build an AI environment, if you're looking to be successful leveraging AI, just be aware over half the projects that involve machine or deep or visual or audio forms of AI get negative ROI in their first two years. Just think about that. That intent doesn't always connect well with action. So what we're trying to sort of talk through today is really in a world where 80% of data is going to be computed on that intelligent edge, not just collected, but computed. And we want to try and give you an access to the DNA of what makes successful digital transformation work. So there's a concept called VUCA. Most of you probably heard it, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous, sort of the world we're living in right now. What is clear when you look at the stats below that leaders in each of these areas, aviation, automotive industry, medical appliances and business, industrial and energy, those organizations that are getting digital transfer transformation right, truly understand what VUCA is about. And in fact, on an index score <clears throat> from 285 index in medical, you know, 2.8 times better at living through VUCA than others is that getting the DNA right for being digitally successful will actually drive a capability to live in a highly volatile world. And the volatility before we thought COVID was really technology. The volatility now is both technology, is both customer and internal business needs and natural digital transformation. So what we're seeing in recent work is if you get this right, your upside is even greater than before. If you get this wrong, your downside is even a larger slide than you would have had previously. So we're gonna spend a lot of time today talking about what indicates the right level of success, the questions you should ask yourself, some really good cross industry data on those that get it right, how they're doing it, versus those that are struggling and how much of a gap there is between the two. Look, we've done this work for, gosh, seven years now, and it all started off with about 11 or 12% of organizations understanding it being successful, it gradually crept to 18. 
and it sort of moved up to 28%. But the percent of organizations successfully making this transformation is barely over 10% every year. So you've got to recognize this is not natural, it is not easy, and it requires an extremely well-formed set of ideas to make this happen. So when you think about this process, it's really imperative to realize that this is not an easy dance. It's a very difficult job. So just think about this idea, about where you might be on this whole idea of thinking, designing, and acting for success. Because the reality basically is, where you are in that process is going to pretty much define how good you are. This, this question is important to ask because it's the basic compass question you'll need to ask of you and your own teams. And whether or not you do it individually or as groups, understanding where you are in this process now will give you a really good understanding of what you need to do to be successful. Because there are no limits to success here. It's a combination of process, imagination, and collaborative style that will drive the most successful models out there. So look, let's talk about a very simple Venn diagram. This is not science in its purest sense. How do you think about the ideas of digital transformation? How are you designing workflows, frankly, whether or not it's in the IoT environment, it's back into the cloud, it's in a DevSecOps environment, even back to the way your business units are building you know, potential product. How does that think and design work together? Do people talk a good game but not design? or are people designing out of the concept of thinking? And then the third thing is just basically simple action. Are you thinking? Are you designing? Are you acting in a digitally transformed way? And we'll walk through seven, uh, maybe 14 of those key indicators today so you can understand on a scale of one to 10 where you are. Just self audit, honestly, and you'll be very pleasantly surprised because you'll see where the gaps are and you'll see where the advantages are and where you have to fill those pieces in. We originally did this research with about 2,000 uh, corporations, and then we literally went and did an audit uh, with each of the global 2,000 across 10, 11 major industries. So it, it, you know, aviation, healthcare, manufacturing, consulting, uh, technology, telecommunications, uh, consumer product good, industrial product goods. So we've looked at this inside every single industry. And, and if at the end of the time you'd like to see industry pieces, just drop me a note and I'll happily give you that stuff for free. One thing we will do at the end of the session is that everybody will get a copy of the book uh, digitally with a simple password. It's all bookmarked and measured. And also, if you want to just listen to the book, <laughs> you don't want to read it, uh, you can pick up all the audio files for free at ink.digital. It's a simple play run audible version. We built the model on about 154 variables because we just love playing around with uh, data science. What we realized very quickly, there are a few questions that are absolute indicators of success around this think, design, sort of act Venn diagram. And as a fairly brutal question, and this sort of does look pretty brutal, you'll be amazed how closely your answer will correlate with the level and amount of digital transformation success you're likely to have going forward. It's a remarkably simple measure. And while it's not perfect, it's a very good indication of where you are relative to potential peers in your industry. So if that stays roughly as it is, um, there are two things we should be aware of. Uh, first of all, the very act of turning up to this session is an indication of intent and curiosity, which is fantastic. Uh, and secondly, the thing to remember is that unless you see this as a competitive advantage, unless you see this as a progressive set of successful realignments, it will be very difficult to use our embedded our IoT skills and products to drive successful digital transformation for organization. And as 80% plus of the world is going to be computed on that intelligent edge by 2025, that's where the battleground will occur. So if you are not in those top two groups, uh, you'll need to find some fairly fast and quick methods to get an alignment between where the businesses should be going and where our development, our deployment, and our operational skills need to be leading the corporation to. It's difficult to build an amazingly effective IoT devices or, or, or live on that intelligent edge unless the organization is also changing its business model and processes at the same time. So if you're in that top two group, I think which is 6% and was the other one 15, Daniel, something yeah. like that. Yeah, it's about 21%. It's pretty representative of what we're seeing elsewhere. Uh, this uh, webinar, I think, will help you re-educate and reinform 
as many of your colleagues as possible. And by all means, when we give you the digital code, pass it to everybody in your organization. We want to educate, inform, and enable people to thrive and win here, not just the sort of few select that have managed to do it so far. So let me just go back to the, uh, to the slides and walk you through, I think, some really important parts of this process that I think make a big difference. You have to think, you have to design, and you have to act in a digitally transformative manner. You can't just talk about it, you can't just do it in isolation, and you can't just see small specs of deployments work organizationally. So just think about this issue uh, across industries. From research we've seen elsewhere in the automotive industry, 80% of vehicle users data is going to drive the value of in-car personalization. Look, you may want to buy a car based on the specifications and what you see on a website, but the experiences you have inside that car may be much more powerful than marketing, or sales, or even possibly advanced engineering elements at driving your desire to buy that car again, to recommend that car to others. So data for the first time can manipulate experiences in a car that have huge ripple effects uh, for other parts of the whole automotive industry and the buying cycle. Think about the industrial sector, that probably by 2025, robots will be expected to perform about 25% of industrial activities, not just in the Western world, but globally. The whole idea of co-robots has now become very common in light manufacturing as well. Think of the incredible value of the data from those industrial capabilities across the world, gathered on the edge, computed on the edge, redeployed, uh, redeveloped, reoperationalized on the edge. Understanding that the, that the intelligent edge and this idea of how devices and embedded information systems pass information back and forth may be literally the difference between industrial success and industrial failure, much more so probably than human labor has been able to do over the last 200 years. Think about the defense industry. Uh, in the US alone, the government's talked about investing over $700 million in the cloud by 2025. The idea of having battlefield cloud-based applications that work in and out of specific military situations isn't science fiction anymore, it's science reality. So think about how we develop devices, how we develop um, the internet of things to function in defense situations demands a very different set of precepts than we may have ever used before. So you have to recognize the world around us is changing very fast. And all these things tend to be highly connected in process. They're not necessarily isolated. We all know this story. An A350 has over 6,000 sensors in it. How that data is used to make major business decisions, tactical automated decisions, radically changes what digital transformation looks like. And I think if you think about the embedded industry, it may well be the largest catalyst for deep, wide-ranging digital transformation because the volume of data, how we analyze it, apply AI to it, it's going to be fundamental, right, in a world where we don't have enough humans to do this and are not enough humans or processes to do it in real time. So thinking about the power that we have as an industry to accelerate and transform far faster than our sort of predecessors is a really important part of this journey, a sort of awareness to getting it done. Think about the, the, the transport industry. We talk a lot about... Um, truck trains, one driver, three trucks, right? But if you actually realize by harnessing sort of autonomous technologies, you could save 160 plus, 168 billion dollars a year, that's actually equivalent to the import value from the US to China in 2017. These are very, very big numbers. So the reality is our ability to digitally transform the data, the autonomous nature of our industries may be far greater than the previous generations we've ever worked with. And that means there's a responsibility for us to actually drive this little digital transformation process forward. So here's what we're gonna do pretty quickly. I'm gonna show you what the seven drivers of change are. And you can just self forward and go, are we at one end, one? Are we at the other end of the scale 10 where we're really leveraging this? Or are we maybe somewhere in the middle, what do we do? Think about questions you'd like to ask on any of these. Totally happy to ask them because they've been the basis of this annual work for the last seven or eight years. We're going to look at the challenges every organization faces, some worse than others, but I recognize that if you understand the world and you embrace it, it still doesn't mean it's going to happen. So understanding how to overcome each of these challenges is a really important part of that think, design, act sort of Venn diagram that will make a difference. And then I'm going to actually show you 
uh, all the seven digital DNA markers of success. Some may not be relevant uh, to you. You may be very high on five, but you don't need two. And that's okay because that's the way the world goes. And then actually, if we get time, we'll talk about five habits that we've seen make a huge difference in this world, much more so behaviorally than anything else. We'd love questions as we go through the process too. So think about this. You can get the drivers right and you can get the challenges wrong. But really successful DNA, digital DNA, primarily comes from your ability to match your view of the world, what the opportunities are, and understand how you need to handle the challenges internally. And it doesn't matter if we're in the embedded or the IoT industries or in software applications that sit in clusters, or even if we're just trying to have a website that, that runs an effective connection between customer to supply chain. This truth of challenges and drivers is an essential part of the conversation over time. So I want to ask you some questions and I want to ask you to think about on a scale of one to 10, right? One is not good. 10 is, it's very important. Where you think your IOT thinking design and operations are. Now be honest, right? Because the advantage of these types of work is it can tell you where gaps are. So, and sometimes just being very high on a 10 doesn't make a difference. Yeah, it's actually a great question because that was my first reaction too. So defense spend as part of GDP in the US is around about 15%. It's actually the same size as the healthcare industry, which is the largest uh, industrial sector in the US economy. The reason why it's a large number is that's just for cloud-based hosting and technology. That is not the whole element of um, the tech spend in the industry. The fact that they just so publicly announced, hey, look, we're going to spend three quarters of a billion dollars on cloud, cloud only, is to me an indication of how they're sprinting towards a more cyber uh, DevSecOps development environment. So it goes far beyond that as an example. There are billions and billions of dollars being invested on battlefield cyber, battlefield uh, virtual you know, development process. If you look at Nicholas Shalane, who I think is the chief software officer for the Air Force, they're literally talking about live deployment of battlefield uh, software and operations within 10, 15 minutes, half an hour of core design. So that just picks up a very small piece relating to cloud uh, that's just about battlefield cloud. It doesn't even cover the vast array of other technology investments the military is doing around not just the device industry, and I know Wind River is very uh, significant as a player in that area, but just about the cloudification of the defense environment. Just ask yourself as we go through these questions and on a scale of one to 10, because having done this thousands and thousands of times, again, these are highly indicative of where you are on that journey. And if most of you are saying, hey, this is reinforcing what we're thinking, it's added a little bit in, this is a great conversation. I know this deck will be available to have with your colleagues and peers internally to say, look, let's walk through this together. Because if I'm here and you're there, I need to get you from there to at least here and maybe sort of further on that pathway. So scale of one to 10, be honest in your own mind about where you are ask questions as we go along. You may find it interesting. So there are seven basic drivers of change in the world that we live in. And these aren't just my ideas. They're Ray Kurzweil, they're Michael Schrag from MIT but they really follow into these basic areas. Compression of supply and demand, this ability to get things almost instantly. I order it, it comes to me. Big shift in demographics, uh, which some of us may not be aware of, but are really dramatic globally. Customers, people that we sell to or work with, literally have more information about us than we have about them for the first time ever, and so on and so forth. So let me walk through each of these sort of carefully with you. So there's no doubt that there's a massive compression of supply and demand. It's not just the Amazon effect, if I can call it and order it, but every single sector now has the ability to say, look, I can get something very fast. I need virtually no inventory and I can tell you very quickly what's happening and I can adjust to that process. So if you think about your own internal thinking about suppliers that you work with, how you're designing product to exist, how much if you change that design process, based on this almost instant mixture of demand and supply in near real time. On a scale of one to 10, one is, yeah, we're not really talking about it much, to 10 being it's an essential part of our conversations for how we design and build. Just mark yourself down on that sort of one to 10 scale for like maybe 10 seconds. The second driver, uh, which is really important, is that customers actually know more about you than you will ever know about them. And that whole shift in that playing field of knowledge 
really affects how we talk. Think about it this way, right? Imagine you have a product that's had some challenges and there's been some comments in community groups or social posts about it that are negative. Customers can find that literally into Google or Bing in about two or three seconds. The implications of what that means for you, good and bad, right? May have much longer tail effects, months, maybe potentially years. So we recognize that the consumer, the customer, has infinitely more control and knowledge than ever before. I mean, the classic example would be you go into a travel agent at some point and they show you a brochure and then you go, I'm not sure if I believe these pictures. You go online to Pinterest, you put in the hotel and find that it's not even been made yet. That level of instant feedback, that level of complete open playing field of knowledge has real implications in terms of product quality perceptions, competitive capability, you saying things about customers that they can go and then track themselves. So that, that, demo, that issue is very difficult. Now, if you think about how customers are functioning, in 2020, millennials became the largest portion of the workforce globally, not just in Western Europe or Asia, but in developing markets too. Uh, they understand very quickly how to do things in ways that we've never really thought about before. So just think about how those customer needs are shifting with a demographic statement for information you may send in the sales cycle, for how you talk about the product features and benefits, how you express yourself to colleagues that you have internally. And that playing field is really flat. It's, it's so remarkably flat. When something goes wrong and it gets posted or something goes right and it gets posted, there's an instant multiplier effect that occurs before. Retail companies have struggled with this. Industrial companies have struggled with it too. It's important to understand that that customer consumer focus is more aggressive than ever before. Just think about scale of one to 10 and where you sit on that too. Now the other issue, and it sort of relates to that cloud discussion and defense is pay as you go basically means everything. But you don't need to buy stuff anymore. You literally can use it, dial it up, dial it down and abandon it. And it's not just, we see it with Uber. We don't just see it with, I don't know, Airbnb or others. The world is becoming subscription orientated. So when you think about building infrastructure, when you think about the partners that you build with, think about the license models that you want to be running with them that allow you to dial up or dial down depending on what your needs are. Because that's a common, much more common practice than most of us, I think, are comfortable sort of understanding. Now, this is an interesting question. I'll hold here a little on a scale of one to 10. When we started to do this work, we asked CEOs, big organizations, who are you most frightened about that could come into your marketplace? And the traditional answers were, well, big organizations we've sort of been aware of uh, might decide to buy a company and move into our market sector. By 2018, when we asked that question, and again in 2019, same question we'd asked for seven years, that number had shifted. And the CEO said to us, basically 54% of them said, the companies we're really worried about are young startups. We believe that startups present a clear and present danger to our market sector. So if you think about this, over half the companies that are leaders in AI are less than three years old. And you think about these cloud native companies that now dominate vast markets, we've got to look at a very different landscape of competitors than we've traditionally dealt with. And this affects how we build product, how we think about design, and more importantly, how we think about the type of organizational structure necessary to be successful in that environment. So these new competitors matter much more than ever before. Now, the other question, I think it's an important thing to think about on this one to 10 scale is the rate of change is moving exponentially faster. And it's not just the COVID pandemic that has caused this. We recognize that digitally transformed industries, and digitally transformed companies develop faster, apply information faster to new product development, and are also fundamentally much more agile than ever before. In fact, organizations that are really good at this, understanding that the rate of change is growing exponentially, are able to survive and thrive digitally basically two and a half times better than their competitor because they've lent into this idea that change is a constant in organizations, not just an occasional moment. And our belief is with the pandemic that this will widen uh, as, a, as an idea as people recognize unpredictability has to be managed to and through. It can't just be sort of fully understood. So if I think through this process, you know, who would have ever thought a small private company would send a rocket into space 
and then actually have the rocket land, right? This is just a perfect example of how new competitors are changing the whole industrial landscape for embedded and IoT in ways we never would have naturally thought about before. So when you think about these seven drivers, the compression, shifting demographics, flat playing field of knowledge, this pay-as-you-go infrastructure model, this, this basically emergence of new competitors being very clearly digitally native, very IP orientated as being highly competitive with the big global 2000. And you understand that the rate of change isn't gonna slow down. If you get these very right from eight to 10, you are on an extremely strong pathway to successful digital transformation. Two things, one of which is gonna change dramatically around us and we'll have to respond and the other is we're gonna to have to respond too. If Gartner is right, and they've generally been rather good at being right for a long time, 80% of the world is gonna compute through that intelligent edge within four or five years. That means the quality of what we develop, the data that we collect, compute and redistribute is gonna be far more important to businesses than ever before. But there's no doubt that the IT part of digital transformation has been remarkably successful, but with so much of the world about to compute through that intelligent edge, there's gonna be increasing pressure for what we do to make a difference. I think to some extent, we have to lean into that, maybe a little earlier than we may expect, to explain how the devices we are designing, deploying, operating, can actually help change the fundamental nature of how our business works. Data is going to become, every CEO will tell you, the lifeblood of any company that gets through this digital transformation period. Much of that data, I mean, I think Wind River has like two plus billion devices out there, is gonna be an important part of those instant, almost automated decision-making. So I'd look at the data you're collecting, I'd look at the data you're analyzing, and I'd actually, from an operational automation standpoint, and then for maybe a new business insights perspective, be very open to sharing this with the management. I think that's increasingly seeing a wider lens for what this world is in terms of data value and particularly in the embedded business too. Yeah. So I want, to, I want you to recognize something uh, that I think is very important as we go through this process, right? If you're thinking about designing for what I call the digital paradox, I've got to be efficient, got to be effective, and I've got to be innovative at the same time. If you can get those three things running together, your chance of being successful is one and a half, two and a quarter, uh, just over two times better than your competitors in each of these sectors. Because the challenge has always been, I can be effective, I can just do it more and more, I can be efficient with less resources, or I can do something incredibly innovative. It may not necessarily work now, but it gets us to the next level. This sense of answering the classic sort of paradox of efficiency, effectiveness, and innovation sits at the very heart of digital transformation success. Being able to solve that sort of three-legged paradox all at the same time is vital. And that's one area where the embedded device business may have a huge advantage over the traditional IT methodology because we can build better devices, we can deploy and operate them to be highly efficient, and the things we ask them to do can be incredibly innovative. That's far easier than with an IT world. We have to deal with a lot of human interface, a lot of natural business process. So think hard about this innovation paradox. You saw uh, the rocket that went up and down into space. That was innovative. It was clearly more cost efficient than NASA could do. And the ability for it to land was extraordinarily effective. And that type of mental thinking, that type of think, design, act, that sort of paradox of effective, efficient, and innovative really needs to sit at the heart of world-class digitally transformed embedded development deployment and operations so think about that and how you can make those changes tomorrow just in the way you think and behave so there is another question that's interesting which is where do your leaders sit and i think it's been a couple of questions that sort of imply well we're not close to the leadership ground here's a remarkable fact that we found from the research if you can solve the efficiency effectiveness and sort of innovation paradox you then need to understand there are seven really important challenges that drive this. But the reality is this, your leadership needs to be fully engaged on a daily basis. Organizations that are successful at digital transformation, their executives spend an ungodly amount of time doing this, two and a bit days a week. So if your leaders, not just at the C-suite level, but at the sort of departmental level are not heavily invested in making this happen, it's really difficult to make it occur. So when you think about it too, right, what's your resilience, your grit about failure? 
Do you abandon issues? Do you keep going? Do you adjust through the process? If you're really good at facing failure, but you don't withdraw, in fact, you lean into it, you're going to be more successful than if you constantly retreat. This is a complicated process, all right? It also is measured very differently. One of the things we've seen with every industrial organization that succeeds, they measure digital transformation success for their devices, for their embedded environments, in many ways very differently than they used to measure it five years ago. So don't try and use the metrics of the old world to try and define the metrics of the new world. It'll be very difficult to be successful that way. They're also extraordinarily collaborative. People do not work in silos. They work across functions, across teams, and it's a constant focus on that collaborative work style because learning is an iterative process. So think about your own development teams. Think about how those development teams work with each other, how those operation teams work with the development and the deployment teams, and how actually you end up working directly with the business units. You have to have a lot smaller amounts of information passing more collaboratively on a more constant basis. The other thing is this, the most successful organizations retrain their staff three and a half times more financially than organizations that are not being successful. People and their skills really matter in a digital age. If you can't solve that challenge, if you can't invest significantly there, it's very difficult to be successful. Using people with skills that don't necessarily match where you need to go will hold you back. Trying to recruit new staff is extremely difficult. So the most sensible route is to overtrain existing staff on skills and techniques necessary for this new world. And the metric is if you invest about three and a half times more than your competitors per person, you'll get results two, three times higher as an organization. So the multiplier effect is very significant in this situation. Now, the other issue is you've got to run alternative strategy. One of the things we found in financial services, in healthcare, industrial and particularly in aviation was that it wasn't a one size design fits all world in other words you always run parallel possibilities because if method a wasn't working well method b could come into the process that development of alternative strategies is a vital part of that success so on a scale of one to ten when you get this deck just think about and you'll you'll see the same questions in the book on certain pages are you open to this experimenting sustaining alternative design or are you over committing to one technique early? There's a lot of iterative movement in this process. And I think the other question really is, is how much are you leveraging the idea of digital transformation just beyond what I call customer facing items? Are you thinking hard about automation? Are you thinking hard about how you use digital transformation to radically adjust your CapEx or even OpEx models? That's an important executive discussion. And that's where I think we can step in very quickly make a difference in this embedded category. So pay as you go strategies, aviation, medical, industrial leaders in these sectors are significantly higher on an index than the organizations in those sectors not succeeding. Pay as you go is clearly the way the world is going to go. If I think about your leaders, are they a little on the edge about this or do they feel very safe? Digital transformation is really really difficult, right? So if they're not living on the edge, it's going to be very difficult for them to be successful. And it's the Mario Andretti quote here. If things seem under control, you know, it's just not quite going fast enough. That's absolutely true when we think about the DNA of digital transformation. The second thing to really think hard about, I think when you think through this, is a really concerning issue, I think, about your own time. So as I've said here, leaders in these sectors spend at least these number of hours a week, they told us, physically dealing with the ideas of digital transformation. So in your job as leaders and your functions, you've got to be spending a similar amount of time educating, sharing, discussing, thinking, designing and acting differently for success. This is not just going to happen on a Friday evening or weekends on a Tuesday. It should be a core part of your daily process, two, three, maybe four hours a day, thinking and acting and designing your world to be digitally transformed. And while you can see some significant hours difference here, in, for example, the energy sector, maybe compared to medical devices, these are still significant amounts of time, at least a day, day and a half, sometimes three days a week, two and a half, three days a week of actual work time. It's a very serious area. You can't come across it casually. You have to invest time and energy to get it done. Second thing, and this is the comment I made about the 
computing on the sort of intelligent edge by 2025. There are new themes and streams of data. Data is going to come from a lot more places than ever before in a lot new interesting formats and ideas. Understanding how you can use, aggregate, apply AI to these data sets in the work that we do, where there's, I mean, zeta bytes of data coming in every year, is going to make a much more direct difference on the business than ever before. Performance automation data may be really, really powerful in ways you haven't seen historically. So think about that as you go through a process. And again, the book will have all these elements in it. Again, look how the medical industry in particular, not healthcare, medical, right, has been very good at understanding the various streams and themes of data coming through that process. It's really dramatic. So before I go on, I think, Dana, there's been a couple of some questions in Q&A. Yes. I'd love to answer them in, in live time if we can. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, excellent. Yeah, some good questions for you here. So um, I'll read them out, Michael, and, and then you can go ahead and answer them. Of so, course. Um, Question one, one of the biggest obstacles to digitization is funding. How do we justify yes. funding to senior management? So there's two things we learned. I used to have that question. It costs a lot of money. The organizations that actually get it right spend less proportionately than organizations that get it wrong. And I used to recommend people did whiteboard sessions. You can't do those in rooms right now. But one of the things we found really works is find case studies, examples in your industry uh, where competitors or customers have been digitally transforming. In fact, the thing that works the best is a slew of these case studies or references online, because at the end of the day, we can put as much data as we want in front of people. What really tells the story best are competitors and customers doing it. So as you know our own industrial sectors, we know our own competitors, just use examples of where it's working showing, and showing to people. Secondly, it doesn't actually cost a lot to do it in the embedded category, because we're already a highly digital environment. I think the best way I would ever use the data for is to collect data we've got and say, how could this data that we're collecting be used to transform how we design, how we maybe deploy in our embedded environment, how can induce more automation, and how could this information be used to make better products and services? If you can answer those three questions, generally, you don't need much more definition of, for budget than that, because you've already got the data. If you can show examples of competitors, uh, maybe customers in your sector doing this well, that will tell the story very well for you. And in fact, most of the successful digital transformation stories we've ever seen are done in-house. They don't buy consultants. They don't buy big service suppliers. They do it themselves. They do the hard grind themselves. That means you've probably got more evidence at hand with you than you currently thought you may have done. It's a great question. I think there is a lagging side in legislative requirements of how certain industries can operate. Therefore, that has an impact on how they can set their digitalized digitize business up. What is your opinion on how fast uh, legislative environments can be changed? So there's an interesting comment from Ray Kurzweil, who is the sort of head of thinking at Google, obviously very famous sort of futurist. And Ray says, imagine a pond, it's very flat, and you drop a pebble in the, in the center. Businesses function in that center, really heavy ripple. Well, governments function at the edge. And my argument is what used to be a pebble being dropped into the water is now a really big stone, but it still takes a long time to get to the edge of government. And I think digital transformation generally is working at a speed that's so much faster than government legislation can ever catch up with. This is gonna be a growing problem over time. But there are places that you can digitally transform your business that have nothing to do with government legislation. So the way you think about designing, uh, deploying and operationalizing your devices, can be radically digitally transformed without any legislative requirements. How much you can gather from customers uh, is an issue that you require very significant legal guidance on. But if you could digitally transform your development processes to be two, three, four times faster, three or four times more innovatively, two or three times more efficiently, that won't touch the edges of legislation in your markets, but it will change your OPEX and CAPEX models. So we always say to people, look at your OPEX and CAPEX models first and how you can digitally transform your processes there to be successful. Governments will catch up, but it is not going to happen very quickly. GDPR is something that probably should have been in place six to seven years ago. It's now happening. Now it's adjusting. That may be a 10 or 15 year cycle. But look at your OPEX, look at your CAPEX, look at your development processes first. You can make radical differences there much quicker than any legislative process in government could ever change for you. It's a great question. Thank you. 
a little bit different, uh, more on data and decision making, but we collect lots of data, but sometimes struggle to put it all together and clearly aid our decision making. Um, what is your opinion on the best place to start? So I, I'm a huge believer in the use of machine learning and deep learning because the a machine's ability to work 24 by 7 at outrageous speed far exceeds the, the accumulation of all human cognitive skill. And at the same time, I think we, we attempt to look for patterns when what we have to think about is outcomes. I think if we try and understand what's the outcome we're looking for from the data, and we can start applying some basic machine learning algorithms, and there's many of them out there, you might be pleasantly surprised at the number of hypotheses the machines come back with. We can still say yes, no, maybe. I think the challenge is we often try and use human calculation skills on vast arrays of data. You just can't run through enough volume fast enough. So discuss the outcome you want, apply these machine or, or deep learning algorithms to the data you've got. I think 85% of them will be rubbish, right? Because that's what machines do. But the 15% will be golden that come out of it and they can matriculate so much faster, you'll get to truth much quicker. But think about the outcome, apply the AI, and then filter through the stories the AI comes back with, machine deep learning, to find some truth very quickly. It's really not a very expensive activity. Thank you. Um, next question is uh, on people. And um, I think that, that's a great topic. Oh, people, <laughs> yeah, they're in a box now. <laughs> <laughs> that, you, that you brought up not so long ago, Michael. But um, you mentioned the people challenge, um, retraining staff, um, recruiting new skill sets. We have found this to be a fundamental difficulty. What strategies do you suggest and do you agree AR is a key tool to overcome these challenges? Yeah, AR is. Uh, it t here's what we found, and honestly, a lot of it is by watching errors. Uh, there's one very interesting organization in the US called USAA. Uh, we may not know it outside, but it's one of the largest insurance companies. It's based in San Antonio, Texas, and it's primarily, in fact, totally for people and near relatives that have done military service. So they were in the very traditional insurance business, run a premium, handle claims, look after customers. They realized that if they wanted to move that to a very digital model, people self-actualize, people self-serve. And in the development area, it was a very important deal. They had to completely change the way they had to think about servicing and servicing the industry. So the first unfortunate answer is it's freaking tough. I don't think anybody has a clear formula for it, but it's very difficult to use old skills to define a new world. But that does not mean the people that have those old skills can't be migrated to the new model. So what we found is you may look at your organization, say, here's my legacy processes, legacy people that are comfortable there. How many can I move from that middle group? Yes, we're doing legacy work. I want to migrate it. And what skills do we need? And I think what we've constantly said is find that migration group, train the hell out of them as much as possible, and at the same time, start hiring as you learn what skills you really need and what attitude you want to have. For example, agile versus waterfall design is a very different model. Some people are very uncomfortable with it and won't move across. Others will. So you have to start thinking about segmenting your work population. Can they handle the legacy? Can they handle the migration? And how do I progressively hire? If I look at timelines, generally this process should run 15 months to two years. It cannot happen any faster because you have to respect what people have done for you, what they can do. And those skill sets need to be progressively tested in the real world. So for any skill you may learn theoretically, people generally need between three and seven occasions to get that skill. Well, depending on how frequently that work happens, that could take anything from a year up to two years to do. It is very, very tough, but you have to lay out for your HR functions that journey, and you have to lay out what you need and don't think you have instant resolution. It just won't happen. Okay, on to the next question. Do you have metrics from that list of leaders in digital around uh, percentages of CapEx slash OpEx invested in their digital transformation or percentages on increased revenue slash profitability service? Yeah, so we do, we actually have it by each vertical, so I can't, I can't memorize it and show you, but if you want to drop me an email, uh, michael at inc dot digital i'll happily send it to you for any of the industries you want to look at it's actually a cheat sheet it'll show you what leaders get versus what laggards don't achieve so you can actually understand the gap across uh, 26 metrics inside opex capex process uh, brand everything else so drop us an email at the end michael at inc dot digital got that wrong it's a bizarre michael at ink dot digital and i'll just send you back the sheet that has the answers per industry for you 
One important component for building IoT enabled service is the IoT platform. Building mm -hmm. or buying is one of the questions. What is your advice? Could you say the question again? Sorry, I just- no, I think I the question it. here is, do we build or do we buy the IoT platform? Yeah, so I think I'd actually change the question a little bit, right? I think the question is not the platform so much anymore, but what else goes around it? So if you build, what are you going to have to add into the to the device over its time? How are you going to manage it? How are you going to deploy it? How are you going to add in AI services or cyber elements you want? So I think there's an increasing focus that, you know, there are obviously organizations like Wind River are, you know, the largest uh, embedded device company in the world, right? But I think it's about pushing for more than just the OS. It's about pushing for how do I design, deploy, operationalize, and manage over the life cycle, the whole product life cycle, not just in that process. Because once we get to this world of 2025 and 80% of the world is computing on this intelligent edge, our IoT devices are going to have more than one purpose over the life cycle. We're going to adjust. We're going to realign. We're going to have to use them as living, breathing measures of the world. So I think it's a, it's a wider discussion than just that OS discussion. Clearly, you want to work with organizations that are investing in this, that are leading in this already, but ask for more and ask for a longer product lifecycle process. And I think it makes people more successful. Brilliant. Um, and I think that was one of the last questions in the Q&A. Um, and I think that's great timing with just a few minutes left. And I, I had a question for you, Michael, that I think it's a broad one um, and a lot of people think it, but maybe a good way to, to wrap up the session is what is next after digital transformation? So I think there's actually two after next, right? Organizations that are not successfully on this journey, I mean, really successful on this journey by 2025 may not exist. I mean, quite seriously, we always talk about the Fortune or Forbes turnover process. It's faster than ever before. The world is digital. The, the way we think, the way we design, the way we act is a digital first lens in everything we do. If you can't make this transition through, if you can't think about these questions and where you stand, there may not be a future. You, you may have a solid legacy business, but think about the change in population. Think about the way we think about business models. You won't get there. What I think happens when you get over this transom and you've, you've built a successful digital DNA so you've got to start thinking about this in this intelligent edge because it's very clear that with 80% of the world computing at the edge, our ability to design, deploy, operationalize, and manage devices in this constant flow, all right, of almost like a heartbeat of intelligence is going to be what divides those that are really successful in the next phase versus those that have a digital platform and a wrapping but don't really have a digital ecosystem that's working with them properly. And I think that 2025 barrier, that sort of computing on the intelligent edge that Gartner talks about is really what's going to happen next. And we're clearly transitioning there right now, but we become data centric, data managed, data augmented, data automated system companies very, very quickly. And the pandemic, honestly, is inducing a more rapid dance towards that timeline than would have naturally happened in the market already. How do you actually measure your digital transformation progress? Which I think is, a, is another great question. To great ask. question. I'll give you a simple thing. Take the book, uh, use those two sets of questions. Start now. Measure yourself against challenges, drivers, and the digital DNA components I didn't fully cover today. Tell us where you are. You'll know very quickly. You can come back. There's an audit site available at ink.digital. But come back uh, through Daniel. Drop us an email, and I'll tell you where you sit. Now then do that three, six, nine months from now. If you've not moved from where you are and you're low in the curve, you have some challenges. But if you're seeing progress, because this is a tough, tough journey, you should be able to measure your own progress against drivers, challenges, and the digital DNA pieces. And I'm more than happy to forward the metrics models too, so you can see where those changes occur. But it's a journey. It, there's no sort of you know, time walk to get there. But you have to start now because it takes a while to get there.